Morning. Well, welcome back to Zion. Thanks for coming out to join us this morning, whether you're joining us here in person or online. Glad to be with you in worship today. I'm Pastor Kale, serving alongside Pastor Brandon, uh, and a lot going on this Sunday. It is fourth Sunday after Epiphany. It is Life Sunday, and it is also Sausage Supper Sunday, as if you're here, you can probably smell. So let's, uh, let's begin with our opening hymn. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. Receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. God has had mercy on you and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to forgive you of all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Psalm 41. Blessed is the one who considers the poor, in the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. 
The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, When will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words, while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say, a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me, and raise me up, and I may repay them. But this I know, that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, by your Spirit you breathed life into Adam and made him a living being. By your Son, Jesus Christ, you redeemed Adam and all his descendants from sin and every corrupting effect, which at last you will remove forever when creation is restored in the resurrection. Convince us by your Word and Spirit of the value of all human life. Where life is fostered and preserved, let us give thanks. Where life is vulnerable or abused, give us courage. Where life is fragile and debilitated, give us compassion. Where life is injured and dying, point us in hope to the resurrection, where he who does all things well will make all things new. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. Our Old Testament reading is from Micah chapter 6. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent, you, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, 
Remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, please rise. <laughs> Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. <coughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We continue now by confessing our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed.
Please be seated for our sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things that happens pretty often as a pastor is you get kind of put on the spot with difficult questions. Uh, there's tough questions about our theology. There's tough questions about our practice. There's tough questions about our God. Uh, but the tough questions really all have one thing in common. Uh, they almost all include the word why. And if you're a parent, uh, you know what this feels like. Uh, my little kids aren't quite at the point yet where they're at the why phase, but they're almost there. And if you're a parent and you've been through that, uh, you know when you get to that phase at around four or five years old, you can be sure that they'll ask why about everything, no matter what it is, and they'll follow it up with a chain about five or six more why questions. You'll get asked again and again and again until you fall back on every parent's favorite answer, which is, look, just because, okay? <laughs> 
just because. And even though the why questions are tough, they're important too. They're part of learning, they're part of development, not just for our kids, but for Christians as well, for us. This Sunday we're celebrating Life Sunday. And this is a Sunday when we you know, set it aside usually in January to celebrate life itself. And so this weekend I wanna dig into one of the why questions. And it's a very simple one. Why value life? And I want to look at three ways that we answer this question as, as humans. Uh, first, that, that life has instrumental value. Second of all, that life has intrinsic value. And then third of all, that life has divine value. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And in exploring these answers, we're going to run into pit, some pitfalls. But we're also going to run into our God. And most importantly, we're going to run into his gospel. So... Why value life? Uh, one of the really common ways of answering this question is we value life because it has what we sometimes call instrumental value. And what that means is life has value because it's useful, you know, because it benefits us to value life. We, we value life because of what it can do for us, what it can produce, what it can make. Now, admittedly, when you say it that way, uh, it, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that it's kind of a self-centered way to look at it, right? Uh, but I'll tell you, much of the world would answer the question this way. Uh, you've got insurance companies, for example, who ask the question whether it's worth it to continue to pay treatment for sick people based on their progress, based on what they can do. In another way, and, and, and I, I don't want to oversimplify this at all or imply that it's the only factor, but in another way, you get people who choose abortion based on the amount of time or effort it would take to raise a child. But before we get too smug about this one, before we start looking down our nose at all those people who would look at it this way, let me tell you about a shut-in that I used to visit. I used to visit him, and I say it that way because he's passed away now. This particular shut-in, uh, at the time that I met him when I came to Zion, uh, in fact, it was when I came to Zion as a vicar, uh, he had pretty severe hearing loss. And uh, so we had trouble carrying on conversations uh, throughout my time visiting him. But he also had macular degeneration. So over the years that I visited him, if you know what that is, his vision deteriorated to the point where he couldn't see hardly at all. Uh, he loved to read the newspaper, and he had one of those big magnifying glass and light things, like the thing you used to look at microfiche in the library on. It was huge. And even with that, he couldn't see to read the newspaper. Not too much later, he got to the point where he couldn't walk anymore. And not too much later after that, he got to the point where he could barely stand. And, and, and he asked me a question. And it's a question that I've heard, certainly not just from him, but over and over again from people. He said, Pastor... Why am I still here? That's what he said. And as we talked in the conversation, it became very clear that the reason he was asking that was because he felt like a burden. He felt like he couldn't do anything for anybody. He felt like he wasn't of any use anymore. And if you put yourself in his shoes, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable thing to think. You know, it's the kind of thing that people will say to us People say to pastors, and they'll say it to you too, probably, if you have family members who are in that situation, and, and we'll try to talk them out of it until it's us laying in the bed, until it's us who can't get up, until it's us who, who can't do anything for ourselves, let alone anything for anybody else. You know, then it becomes very clear how much we rely on our own utility, our own usefulness, our, our own ability to, to produce things, to do stuff for other people, our ability to contribute for our value. See, this is a trap that it is all too easy for us to fall into. But we know that instrumental value, value based on what we can do, cannot be true for two reasons. One, you know as well as I do when you're talking to somebody else about that, that their life isn't less valuable based on what they can do. And two, Psalm 41 verse 3 says that God sustains his people on their sickbed. God sustains his people in their illness. The very time when we are least productive, least able to do anything, least beneficial, least useful to the, thing, to, to the people around us, that's when God sustains us. Because in our weakness, he's strong. So why value life? It's not because there's instrumental value to life. That's not the answer. 
And maybe it's the second one. Maybe it's intrinsic or inherent value. Now, what that means is that life is valuable in and of itself. And it sounds at first blush like a pretty good answer. Life is valuable because it's just valuable. It's a valuable thing. But unfortunately, here comes our four-year-old again to ruin this answer for us by asking, why? See, inherent value or intrinsic value is the just because answer from philosophy. Life is value just because. It's valuable just because it's valuable. You know, if you're a parent, you probably realize that four-year-olds are never really very satisfied with the just because answer, right? You end up having to say something like, just because, now go watch TV, or go play with your Legos, or something like that to redirect. And the problem here is that when you ask the question and you keep asking the why question, when we say life is inherently valuable, is that you realize that saying that means that life really has no value at all. And here's what I mean. Anytime you take God out of the picture, and you say that something is valuable in and of itself, what you mean is that it has value to us, that we feel like it's valuable. Well, you wouldn't, for example, say that human life has inherent value to mosquitoes, right? They're not gonna defend human life just because it's worth defending. They're gonna defend human life so they can eat, if nothing else. So ultimately, to say that human life has inherent value, value in and of itself, means that we're saying it's worth protecting because we've decided that it's worth protecting. And we feel that way because we learned it from our parents and they learned it from their parents and so on and so forth. And you can take that all the way back as far as you want, but ultimately, here's the problem. You trace it back far enough and you're gonna end up with somebody who decided life was valuable. And we all thought that was a pretty good idea, so we just kept believing it throughout the years. And what that means is, if human beings decided differently, if we decided that life was no longer valuable or that it was only valuable when it was useful or when it was happy or when it made us happy or whatever it is, that would be just as true as the idea that life is valuable. We can't say that life has inherent value. We can't say that life is, in, is uh, instrumentally valuable. Those cannot be the answer to our question, why value life? And as you probably guessed already, the third answer is life has divine value. So this is the place where we turn to faith, but not the way I think that we would expect on Life Sunday. See, unfortunately, our discussions about life issues have too often centered on the law of God, I think. And there's certainly a place for that. Don't get me wrong. There, there definitely is. It is absolutely true that the fifth commandment forbids us from taking life. And so that speaks to things like murder. It speaks to things like abortion. It speaks to things like suicide. It speaks to things like euthanasia. That's true. Those things are all true. But our four-year-old's gonna help us out here. Because when we ask the why question, what we realize is there's something deeper there. There's a reason that the fifth commandment exists. And I think that's spelled out pretty well in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Here's what Paul says. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. We treat life as valuable because it does not belong to us. It belongs to God and it is so valuable to him that he created it and he bought it back. It was worth the blood of Christ. And so I want to think about those two things here uh, as we kind of close things up in the sermon. Uh, first of all, let's think about creation for just a second. In creation, we see how much God values life in the fact that he made it at all. And think about this. God created knowing what it would cost him. You know, we sometimes have this idea that what God does is he creates human beings and plan A is Adam and Eve, and then they uh, eat from the tree that they're not supposed to eat from. And God is kind of scrambling in the Garden of Eden and goes, well, what do I do now? And he makes up all this Jesus stuff so he has something to say to him in Genesis chapter 3. That's not the message of scripture. Jesus is never plan B. The message of scripture is that God knows everything, past, present, and future. The message of scripture is that God knew the cross before he ever said, let there be light. The message of scripture is that he knew what it was gonna cost him to create. But he must have thought that your life was worth it. And that's why you're here. 
He knew what it was, cost, it was going to cost him, and that cost was one that he himself paid. That's the second thing. That's the buying back part. You know, God thought your life was valuable enough to send Jesus to the cross. I mean, probably the most basic message of the Christian faith is that you are worth the blood of Christ. Your life is valuable and so valuable to God that he would pay that price. Your life is important and it's valuable and, and it belongs to your creator and your redeemer. And that's why we value life because you are not your own. You're bought with a price. Years ago, a friend of mine got married. And uh, when he did, uh, on the day of his wedding, he, he drove this brand new sports car. And I, I don't remember what kind it is, but, but he drove it to the wedding. He drove it to the, from the ceremony to the reception. And he drove it from the reception to the place that he and his new wife were staying that night. And everything was going great. You know, the car ran great. It was brand new. It sounded great. It looked great. It was fun to drive. He and his wife were having a great time. They loved it. They went from this, they got married at the ceremony, of course, they went from the church to the reception, and they did the cake and, and the dancing and all the stuff that you do, and then it got time to go. So the wedding party ushered them out to the parking lot, and they didn't even decorate the car, because they knew that the car was nice, and they knew that the car was new, and my friend and his new wife got in the car, they headed to the hotel they were staying at, and that they, as they drove into the parking garage that night, they pulled up a little bit too far. <laughs> And as he went to take the ticket, the gate slammed down on the hood of the car. <laughs> and this particular gate not only slammed down once, it had some kind of a sensor in it, I guess, and it realized there was something down there, so it picked itself up. But then it thought it was in the clear, so it crashed down on the hood again, and it did it one more time, three times, before my friend finally came to his senses and backed the car up enough to clear the gate. When he did, there were marks all the way across the hood. It was a valuable car. And that was bad enough, but it was also a loner. <laughs> and not only was it a loner, it was a loner from somebody from the family that he'd just married into. So all night he's taking great care of this car. He'd driven slowly everywhere he went because he knew the car was valuable, but it wasn't just because of that. He took great care with it because he knew it didn't belong to him. Life Sunday could very easily be called Stewardship Sunday, because ultimately that's the message. We take care of it like it's somebody else's. Life is not yours. Your life is not yours. It's God's. And that means we value it like somebody else has entrusted it to us. We value it because it's a gift. We value it because God has given it to us. By the way, the owner of the car uh, never charged my, uh, my friend a dime for it. He never asked for anything. He got it fixed and it looked nice and everything like that. And so the parallel continues. You know, God not only gave us life as a gift, but when we damaged it, he fixed it for us. He bought it back. God made life new. Psalm 41 is a prayer. It's a prayer about how God protects and he cares for life on a day-to-day -day basis. Even the life of the poor and the sick, even lives that don't seem like they can contribute anything to the people around us. God still says, those are mine and those are important. God says that about all life. From the womb to beyond the tomb, all of it belongs to God. All of it is valuable to him. All of it is worth the blood of Jesus. He says that about all life, but listen, because this is important. He also says it about yours. See, the blessing of being a Christian is knowing that even when you're sick, and even when you're broken, and even you, when you don't feel like you're contributing anything to anyone, you are loved. You are valuable and you are valued even when you don't feel valuable yourself. Even at points like that, God says that you are worth the blood of Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we continue with our children's message. And so I invite all the children forward for that. Good morning, guys. How's it going?
How are you guys? Good? Good. I'm glad. So, I've got two things here on either side of me. Can you see them? I'll put them down here. What's this one? You probably know what. Yeah, it's a present, right? Yeah. What's this one? A box. A box. Right, exactly. So, let's say that these two things were under the Christmas tree. And uh, your mom and dad said you can open one of them. Which one would you pick? Yeah, that one every time, right? Probably not this one. This is the box. It has uh, Walmart bags. Yeah, it has trash inside of it, right? Uh, so, okay, let's see. Can you help us out? Can you open this one for us? Oh, what's inside? Chocolate. Yeah, exactly. That's exciting. So don't worry. These are coming to you guys in just a second, all right? Don't worry. Should we see what's inside the box? Yeah. Okay, let's see what's inside the box, too. I'm going to put these over here so we can look inside the box. All right, can you help us out, buddy? All right. Let's see what's inside there. Yo, oh, it's chocolate. It's the same thing, right? Look at that. Yup. And you know, this is what God says about us. He says, no matter what's on the outside, what's on the inside of us is always valuable and always something that he loves very much. See, they're just the same, right? Yeah. Is that pretty cool? Let's pray. And then I'm going to give you guys one of these. Does that sound okay? All right. Can you fold your hands and bow your heads? And I'll say something and you repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for us and letting us know that you love us. Thank you for making us valuable. Amen. All right, you guys. Let's get you one of these, huh? To take back. And, <laughs> and if you're anything like my kids, get on your clothes. <laughs> you're welcome, parents. <laughs> There you go. Oh, yeah, right. Hey, he might not quite be ready yet. Can you take one for your brother, too? There you go. <laughs> Maybe. If, uh, with the bringing forward of our offerings. Let's pray. God, everything we have is yours. We thank you. Uh, we praise you. And we thank you for uh, giving us these gifts that we can be faithful in, in sharing uh, your life-changing message, your message that uh, gives life, that calls us uh, to value life, uh, the message that uh, calls us uh, to, to share that life uh, with the world around us. Uh, we thank and we praise you today. In your name we pray. Amen. In our uh, prayers today, uh, continue to keep those in our prayer page and our bulletin, as well as a few updates. Uh, for uh, Don Nosher, uh, Don's having uh, a, a hand surgery uh, later on this week. So we pray for uh, success and for, for healing for that. Uh, for Juliana Clements, uh, who's having some health concerns uh, that will need to be addressed with, uh, with surgery. Uh, for Mary Brewster, uh, we, we give thanks to God for a successful surgery she had on Friday and prayers for her continued uh, recovery. Uh, for Scott Rombach, that's the son-in-law of Danny and Brenda Wiesman. Uh, Scott is experiencing some health concerns. Uh, and for uh, Robert Rombach, that's a, a friend of, of the Wiesmans uh, who's receiving treatment for cancer. For Josh Hedges, that's the son-in-law of Sandy Wilson, uh, Josh is also receiving treatment for cancer. Uh, for Dale Jones, that's the sister-in-law of Scott and Pat Jones, uh, pray for strength for the health concerns that she is facing. For Eric Adams, the father of Erica Adams, uh, who's receiving treatment for lung cancer. 
Uh, and we give uh, God thanks uh, for Jensen Harris. Uh, we've been praying for Jensen for quite a while. Uh, the heart surgery was successful, and he's at home and, and recovering very well. So we give God thanks and praise uh, for that. As you're able, please rise for prayer. Almighty Lord and judge of all, do not contend against us, for although your indictment of our sinfulness is true, your Son has suffered our condemnation. Hear him as he pleads for our pardon, and for his sake forgives us our sins, and preserves us as your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all wisdom, you tell us plainly that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but it is your power to all who are being saved. Strengthen the faith pastors and congregations, that they would not turn to man-made wisdom, but boldly proclaim Christ and Him crucified. Lord, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all glory, make us meek before You. Remove our stubborn inclination to follow our own sinful desires. Strengthen us that we would be obedient to Your holy will as we await the day of the new heaven and the new earth. Lord, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, You have given Your firstborn for our transgressions. Strengthen all parents and guardians. The children in their care would not be trained in the transgressions of their forebears, but rejoice in your ways. Remember all Christian households, especially Walt and Dee Dee Welch, Michael Werner and family, Darius Werner and family, Scott and Tyler Wheeler and family, Derek and Carrie Whipple and family, Natalie Weigand and family, Mike and Amy Weiss and family, Danny and Brenda Wiesman, Monty and Karen Williams and family, and Keith and Kathy Willis and family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of lords, you rescued your people from Egypt and confounded Balak the king of Moab for their protection. Guide the decisions and actions of all earthly authority that your people may live in peace and quietness. Use them and us to uphold, support, and protect your precious gift of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, you chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. You use our infirmities for our good. Hear our prayers on behalf of all those who are in need, especially today we lift up Dawn Nosher, Juliana Clements, Becky Bodenstab, Joan Berry, Kevin Morris, Holly Meyer, Janet Asbury, Dawn Earnshaw, Abby Cruz, Anna Seymour, Holly McRae, Mary Brewster, Eunice Weber, Anna Mae Shanebaum, Dolly Meininger, Frank and Ann Shanebaum, Fred Dorr, Pat Benefell, Joan Goosewell, Terry Dossett, Becky and George Smith, Carol Booz, Marlon Shanebaum, Joy Lotz, Ben Deering, Janice Moore, Danny Wiesman, Scott Rombach, Robert Rombach, Josh Hedges, Dale Jones, Eric Adams, Jensen Harris, Devin Trampy, Kim Wall, Carolyn Wells, Don Goble, Veronica Armentrout, Joshua Harris, May Seymour, Paul Knobloch, Paula Sullivan, Catherine Manson, Missy Wiesman, Henry Gavin III, Jennifer Withrow, Sheila Williams, Terry Downs, Terry Zirkelbach, Becky Reinke, Clarence Hoffman, Dan Shane here, Sharon Morton, Renee White, Coy Chafin, Heidi Reynolds, and all those we name before you on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, receive our thanks for the saints whom you preserved in righteousness and delivered to glory. Purify our hearts by your grace and strengthen us against temptation, that we would look joyfully to the day when we will see you in glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh, laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we would not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying...
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. The glory of your presence once filled your ancient temple, so in the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, you manifested the fullness of your glory in human flesh. We give you thanks that his most holy supper, you reveal your glory to us. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood that we may one day behold your glory face to face. So hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated uh, for distribution. Uh, just uh, one note about uh, communion here at, at Zion. Uh, we confess that it is uh, communion between us and God and also an uh, expression of unity and confession of faith uh, to those gathered around the table. And so if, if you're uh, not yet a, a member of Zion or another uh, Lutheran church that shares our confession of faith, we still invite you to uh, come forward and just cross your arms to receive a blessing. And uh, we'd love to talk to you uh, more afterwards about uh, who we are and, and what we believe here. Uh, God's blessings to you during this time of worship.
As you're able, please rise for the Nuke Domenis. Bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. <laughs>
Well, again, welcome back to Zion, everybody. Thanks for coming out to worship this morning. It's a good day to be together in the presence of God. A um, couple announcements for you. Sausage Supper, of course, is this weekend. Uh, we serve from noon to 6. Uh, so if you're, if many of you, probably most of you are working at the Sausage Supper in one capacity or another, uh, the parking is off on the west side if you're here for, to work a shift. If you, could, uh, if you could park on that side of the church to leave that side clear, that would be very, very helpful. Um, and then, uh, yeah, noon to 6, come by, drive through if you're not working, and grab some sausage and some sauerkraut and potatoes and all the good stuff. Um, second of all, uh, adult Bible class is going to be out in the ministry center this morning. So, uh, because everything was going on downstairs with sausage supper and all the prep work and stuff, we're going to be out in the ministry center, uh, this morning for adult Bible class. And last but not least, uh, this is something pretty exciting that's happening. Uh, coming up four weeks from yesterday, uh, so it'll be Saturday night, February 25th. Uh, St. Paul Lutheran High School from Concordia, Missouri is coming here. Uh, their choir is coming here and they're going to do a choir concert for us that evening. Uh, that is the alma mater of such illustrious names as Pastor Meyer and, uh, uh, well, formerly Vicar Ben, now Pastor Benjamin Hader. Uh, so we know some people from there and it's going to be a great concert. Look for more information coming out about that. We'll do a meal for them. We'll have... Uh, We'll be hosting them in houses and stuff like that. Uh, but for now, just put it on your calendar and keep your ears open for more information. Uh, God's blessings on your week.